Can you hear me? Okay. I have it turned on. Is it good? Are you able to hear me okay? It's not coming to the speakers. Testing, nothing, oh there, no, you're not hearing anything, okay, testing, seems like everything is on here. Is there volume on here? Oh. Yeah, this is the, that's, that's where it's connected, right? Yeah, this is the main. Okay. Main main testing, testing. Should I disconnect the that link? Maybe maybe that's what's doing it. Okay. Should I just get started? Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. okay so if you can hear me, then if then we can just start, and hopefully we'll get it we'll get it working. Okay. All right. Well, let's. Uh, I think let's pray together, ask God to guide our discussion today. It's great to see you all, um, and we'll ask the Spirit of God to just work and, and make this a profitable time together. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. I thank you for the beautiful weather outside, um, just uh, the beauty of your creation that's everywhere. And I pray now as we just continue to talk about uh, things from your word that help us to be better leaders, leaders that... Uh, exemplify what you'd want us to do in terms of how we lead people. Help this to be profitable and beneficial. And just give me the right words to say in, in our discussion as we share ideas with each other that they would be helpful to moving forward and growing and becoming more like you. In Jesus' name I pray this. Amen. So I've had a chance to kind of wander a little bit around in the area because I've never been up here before around the town. We drove in in the dark, so then didn't really get any contacts when you're in the dark, but so beautiful country up here. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. And I, I was just, you know, we were just chatting about the, the, the farming season. It used to puzzle me, like, how don't you get frozen out every year? <laughs> but, but the long, the days, all that stuff, that just, uh, it's just amazing how that all works and the good crops that you can get up here. And where we are living in, we're, we're about an hour from, a little over an hour from the U.S. border. And it's very barren. The, the soil there I don't think would quite match up to the kind of soil you have here. Very dry, so they have to farm in a different way. And, uh, but, you know, uh, one of the things that we'll talk about today, we're going to come to that yet, is to reflect on uh, uh, God's majesty and his, how, in, how immense he is, his enormity. And we need to be in awe. And as we grow in awe of him, we should start feeling pretty small about ourselves when we realize who he is. And that's when we talk about the theology of leadership and how it shapes how we lead. So let's do a little bit of a review here. Just There's a couple of some new people here. Welcome. Um, I'm, this review will help a little bit with what we talked about yesterday. 
try, hopefully we can just stress the, the key points. So when I teach, it's kind of like, okay, we're dispensing quite a bit of information, but some of it's new to you, some of it's very familiar to you. But my, my hope and point is that there's some things are just takeaways. If the rest becomes formulated knowledge or things in, that you get to access, you can look at material, you try and remember certain things. We don't retain super well, at least I don't, so we need re places to refer to. But then there's some points need to stick, and I'll try to drive those points home as we review each day just a little bit. Make sure if you can remember this, I think you're in a good place, and that we process it and use it. So before we start, I'm going to just read, they have these passages up here, but I'm going to read Colossians 1, 15 to 20, to, to sort of just help set the tone as we get started. So Colossians 1, starting at verse 15, it says, The preeminence of Christ, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his, of his cross. And what a better verse to start with, to understand who Christ is and what he represents. And as we talk about leadership, we're talking about the centrality of Jesus in all of this, that he is central to all this. And it's out of him that flows the things that we do and we take um, from him. So we talked about this, the essence of leadership is influence, and whether you have a title or not, you influence people around you. And by influencing them, you're making a difference, you're impacting them some way as you interact with people. And I would hope for us here that our influence is actually a positive influence, not a negative influence, because it's all influence. <laughs> so we know both extremes, right? We know the people who are good influencers, and we also know people who can influence poorly. And we don't want to be that. The question is, how would we view leadership? On what basis do we approach our leadership? And, and the, the key verse there in Matthew chapter 20 to 28, you get that whole picture of the disciples thinking it was about status and power and position. That, and that was very much the cultural view that when you lead, you, your status defines you and, and it gives you certain power and authority, which it did. And then Jesus turns their world upside down. He said, no, you will not lord it over others as the Gentiles do or, or boss them around, whatever you want, and, you, and use your authority just to pound people but he said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, or to serve, but to be served. Or to, sorry, he came, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Isn't that something? And he sets the tone for us in leadership. I, I just absolutely believe we get this verse, the teachers, and it's, it's, it's just played out in Scripture, I think, everywhere, especially as you watch the New Testament. But you go back into the Old Testament as well, you see the leadership of people who displayed this kind of leadership. But Jesus turned their world upside down. And he sets a model for us. And the question, I think the hardest part is, how do we do this well? I hope you all believe that. But then the belief has to turn, how do I practice this? How do I learn to apply it better and really model Jesus' type of leadership? And so one of the, the ways that we can evaluate that, engage it, is through these, this three-legged stool over here. And... Uh, the character, without any, uh, this stool cannot stand unless all three legs are intact and firm. If one's loose or one's gone, you fall over. And so you need to make the connection. All these things have to connect together. That character does matter. You know, again, we live in a world where a lot, a lot of believers, they, they compartmentalize, they dichotomize, whatever and said, God, you can have my church life, you can have this life, but do not touch my business or do not touch this part of my world, whatever it happens to be, because that's mine. And, and the understanding of godly character is that it's all encompassing, it's all God's. Everything we do, our behavior, all that we do has to add up. And we talk about different verses where to walk worthy, 
to pursue holiness and to live in, ob in obedience to the Lord. That this is, this is what he wants us to do. We show our love for him by being obedient and pursuing obedience. And we all know we fail every day. And yet the beautiful thing about a merciful God, we come to him and we repent and confess those sins and he renews us. But our, our journey as believers should be continual growth. And, you know, I look at my own life and I look back to when I was, say, 20 and the things I would have struggled with as a 20-year-old and God's patience and taking off the edges where today things I really struggled with there, I'll have, I have victory today as the work of God is sanctified, you know, this work of sanctification and shaped it. And so we have to be committed to that growth until our final breath. There's no time when you say, I've arrived, it's all good. <laughs> you know, you... Anybody knows anybody, but whether they're 95 or they're five years old or a newborn. It's very easy to see in a newborn the carnal the flesh, isn't it? Like I think somebody said, if, if uh, an infant could actually live out their will, they'd all be juvenile delinquents. But they don't have the strength to because they're born with a sinful nature. And they need the, the, the salvation and the change that God brings. And then the story so of growth. And so this... We need to take character seriously. We just cannot downplay it. And if we do, we're in such trouble. Our motive has to be in everything we do that God gets the glory. We talked about that, how easy it is to fall into the trap of us wanting it. There are people recognizing, affirming us, saying, telling us how amazing we are and live off affirmation and that our motive is to please people or to please ourselves. And no, the motive is it just... No matter what, come back. God, are you pleased with me? Are you actually getting the glory for my work? And you bring that to, to leadership in this, in the world. We're dealing with people so much. How easy it is to focus on the flesh and be trapped by that. So God, you get the glory. And then our agenda, can we sincerely say, my agenda, my calling, what I'm doing is yours. And I'm doing what you want me to do, not what I want to do. I think that sometimes it takes brutal honesty to, with that because we can very easily be trapped into or get trapped by thinking, I'm actually doing God's will, but maybe I'm not because I sort of defined what I want to do. So if you're in the church, you're in your world, your family, your business, or like in an organization, like a college, now we have to ask that question, God, are we doing what you call us to do? Help us to do it well. Help us protect us from our own agendas that will take us away. And I think it shows up everywhere. So all those three things in play and in a healthy place, I think we're in really firm foundation. Any one of these have gaps in them or we're not paying attention to it. Boy, we better be careful. So I encourage you, you know, as you reflect, take away, have this in a place where you can kind of just refer to how am I doing in these three areas? Because I think it's a pretty good summary of life and our walk with God and especially as we do and lead people. So any comments or additional insights on this here? I think this is so important we get this and we understand this. Well, I think the, uh, I was thinking of the character first here. Um, character is kind of like my makeup, you know, yeah. in that way. But I can use that to excuse things and so on, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe messed up. Well, that's just my character. Oh, that's, yeah, that's, that's really good. I think this idea that I kind of am who I am, so just, you know, God created me this way, so I don't have to change, just, I'm just who I am. <laughs> I was in a class, actually, where we were talking about stuff like this, and this guy just said, oh, well, that's just who I am. And so it's all okay if I don't correct and grow and work with some of my rough spots and take off some of those edges because I just am who I am. Well, I don't know what Bible you're reading, buddy, but the Bible doesn't, doesn't acknowledge or take address. It addresses the need for continual growth. So, and I think that should be a prayer, right? And God's so patient. I don't know about you. I'm just going to speak for myself. I'm such a slow learner. And sometimes God just has to whack me and get my attention with things that I'm not confronting. And I say, man, 
and I'm so thankful that he does that once in a while. And, and, but he's so patient with us, and I'm so thankful. And so I can reflect in my own life and say, oh, man, I'm a slow learner, but I, I can see the growth that God's doing. And I hope that's your desire, that we just continue to grow and become more like him. So those are, that's a real, I think, a pivotal takeaway. I said, reminder, God's love of language is obedience. He doesn't need us to tell him we love him. We should, it's, it's good to tell him we love him, but it doesn't mean much if we're not being obedient. And the real expression of love is by being obedient to him and desiring to grow in that. And, the, and then we see the critical importance about godly leadership in the church. And I gave you examples where people thought, because God was giving them success, that their obedience didn't matter anymore. Oh, and it's a disaster. It's just absolutely a disaster. But uh, you guys, if we brainstorm here, and we don't want to do that, it wouldn't be hard to identify public figures of Christian, in the Christian context, who have decided that character didn't matter, and eventually it led to their demise. And this, and then we talk about guarding against delusions of what does success mean, and be careful that we don't buy the Western mindset of success. I have a feeling Jesus would have been a complete failure by Western success, wouldn't he? Because he preached, these people saw miracles firsthand over and over, and when he called to them, take up your cross and follow me, it says many of them departed because it was a hard calling. He did, they didn't want it. And so by, from a worldly standard, Jesus would maybe consider a failure. Of course, he wasn't. But we have to be careful not to be caught in those things. And we, we get caught with the comparison of each other. And, you know, when John the Baptist, where he modeled his celebration that people were going to Jesus because he was pointing people to Jesus. That should be our, all of us. Like, we're all in kingdom business, right? Whether you're in a, in a business, you're in a church or organization, our job and responsibility is to point people to Jesus, to introduce them to the gospel, or in the Christian setting where we're working with believers, helping them to grow and to reach their potential through the venue of leadership. And that's what servant leadership really amounts to. Any thoughts or comments to add to this before we move on? All right. I read this quote to you here. We're going we're gonna to move to a little bit more. What does servant leadership look like in action? And here I invite you, because we're talking with people with lots of experience here, to share insights that you've learned what you apply i just do not want you to hear from me thinking like i've got the answer We're, we got straight sitting here is a wealth of wisdom and experience that as we talk about the issue you can add to it and 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 give insights that we all need to hear but it, one of the things that i struggled with and i think i told you this i can't remember if i did but when i came into my leadership at miller i was sold on servanthood but I couldn't, what is the difference between us being a servant, having a servant heart, and actually being a servant leader? And as I studied it more, the lights started to go on, and I realized what that meant, and that's what we're going to do here, is just give some, some meat around that, if, you're, if it's a question for you as well. Um, but it really helped me as I started to realize the, the value of, of servanthood, and yet needing to put it into the leadership context. So here's three things, how Jesus demonstrated servant leadership so somebody read uh, please john 13 4 and 5 uh, and if someone would look up uh, luke uh, chapter 22 verse 42 and maybe the same person well maybe somebody else can take philippians 2 7 and 8 and then i'll just comment on matthew 10 because it's the whole the whole chapter kind of aims at this but if we want to see what does it look like to be a servant leader, and this is, so I want to push it back to you now and to me. Am I doing this or not? You know, it, it, that's how we apply. It's not just knowledge that has to transfer here. Is well, how am I doing this? What, how am I doing in this area? And if we look at the example of Jesus, we can filter that and assess how we're doing. So first of all, he led through the towel of service. So can somebody read that? John 13, 4 and 5.
So here he is, rabbi, an esteemed position. And of course, we know he's, he is the son of God. He's fully God, fully man. And he kneels down and washes their filthy feet. Now, my understanding is they would walk around in sandals. I grew up in Africa where people basically live in sandals or barefoot. And uh, I tell you, it's not a pleasant sight. When you've gone barefoot or in sandals on rough ground, your feet get just hard and, oh, actually, honestly, they're ugly. <laughs> this is what I love. Like, I, we just have a little granddaughter just two months old now. And you hold that little foot in your hand. I mean, just perfect. Eh? There's no blemishes on it yet. Just a, it's the beautiful evidence of God's creation. Add 60 years to that foot. <laughs> and it's just going to have all the wear and tear of walking and life. And so I could think when Jesus knelt down and washed their feet, it was so completely anti-cultural to them to experience this. But he said, I came to serve you, and I'm going to show you by washing your dirty feet. Oh, man. And then the question comes to us, what does that look like in our culture, in our setting? How do we, how do we take up the towel of service as a leader? What are your thoughts on that? What, what would be some examples how that would look? We, I know some people practice feet washing and, and that, but I'm not really talking about that. I'm talking more the, 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 the principle that it's teaching us. I think a comparable thing is washing somebody's armpit, maybe. I don't know. That'd be almost equally disgusting. But no, that's not what we're talking about. It's the principle. What would be a way this could look in, in our world now? I think so. And uh, that's, that's really a misguided interpretation because um, so when we hire at the school, one of the questions I'll almost always ask at the beginning is, are you above any job? Because if a person says, well, I'm a teacher, I don't do menial jobs. It's kind of like, ah, you know what, you belong someplace else. This is going to work here. Because we have this philosophy that none of us are above any job. If a toilet needs cleaning, you clean it. It may not be your primary job, but somebody needs help, you do it. So we were hiring this one man, and he said, well, man, I came from a context where there was this hierarchy. Eh? Here's your faculty here, and here's your lowly staff here. <laughs> and never the twain shall meet, because these are the, the grandmasters, and these are the peons down here. And now, I'm saying that somewhat sarcastically, and I'm exaggerating a bit, but don't kid yourself, that plays itself out. And on our, on our setting, if I believe if we're going to apply this, and I'm just speaking for our setting now, if any of us, myself included, ever think we're above any job that needs to be done, we're, we've now put ourselves into an elevated spot where we don't belong. Yes, we have our primary duties, but boy, you see somebody, a student, clean and wash, and give them a hand, give them a hand. Or if it just needs to be done because nobody else can do it, you do it. And, and, it's, it's, and it's serving and telling people that we, we care about you, what you're doing, that those tasks are really important as well. It's not just the people who are instructors or whatever title they happen to have. And we serve people. Now, there, it's bigger than this, though, because the Tala service is the messy work of coming alongside broken people and caring enough to serve, serving them, and is in the sense that you want to help them in their journey of life. And it's saying, man, it's so easy just to ignore that person. Man, they're so broken, they're so messed up, I just hope they figure it out. If a leader thinks that way, and these are people under your care, we're not getting this principle that we have picked up that towel of service, and, the, and what's connected to it, of course, is sacrifice. It comes at sacrifice to do this. If we're, if we're going to get to the messy work of helping people to grow 
then we have to know it's going to come, it's going to come at a cost. But if you're serving people and you care for them and you come alongside them, if people are wondering, how do you gain influence? Just live a life of service that shows that you care about people and you'll help them where you can, you'll speak into their lives, you'll, but, but if it's just only on certain levels you're ever willing to talk to people, you're, you don't have much chance to develop, honestly, a, a, an ability to really serve people. So Jesus led through the tower service. It was hands-on, caring for his disciples, telling them this message that they had to, they couldn't be above any job. And that allows them a venue into all kinds of places where you can serve. Otherwise, if we think we're above it, we, we withdraw all kinds of opportunities to actually influence people. Any thoughts on that? Does that make sense? Peter? Oh, that's a, that's a good point. It's not, it's not exempting anybody, is it? It's everybody. Yeah, very, very true. All right, let's, let's read Luke chapter 22, 42, and then Philippians 2, 7, and 8. Somebody can read that, please. Yeah, and I think what we, we miss often is... Jesus, when he came, he knew his purpose was to come and to die. And it came at a great sacrifice for the people. And that sacrifice was for us. It came at a high cost. We can't even imagine the torture on the cross that he went through. But he was willing to do it for us. And now if we translate that sacrifice that he did there, his willingness and, and even the work that he did, on this earth, the, the hours he put in, the investment he put into his, his uh, disciples to prepare them came at great sacrifice. He was tired. He was worn out. And he goes aside to rest. And, and but he, he, the ultimate sacrifice was that. And if we're going to do servant leadership well, we have to be willing to sacrifice our comforts, our well-being, and say, man, I'm going to have to stay up late tonight because this is something I have to invest in. Somebody's got a tragedy going on or somebody's got an issue in his pastor, you'll really understand this. Somebody loses a loved one or you have a crisis going on. Does it come at a sacrifice? It does. Because you're sacrificing your time, your, your comfort to say this is more important. And I believe that often separates leaders from non-leaders is that willingness to step in to do that and consistently do that. And, and, you know, it, it's so interesting because our selfishness just wants to kick in so quickly. Um, so I was, I was it, this just happened uh, three months ago or so. I was, I was coming back from Toronto. So you know Toronto has this reputation of being a little bit uh, chaotic at the airport at Pearson there. So I went really early. I'd say four in the morning. So I'm going to beat the rush. <laughs> so I get there. And I just whipped right through. It was really nice. The airport was largely empty, and I went to this big area that was just, just, <laughs> no one there. So I went and found a place I was going to have a snooze, eh? Well, this young guy, about 30 years old, what does he do? He comes and literally sits down right beside me. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I wanted space. Can you please just go? 
<laughs> I didn't say this to him. You know, because that was my selfishness, and it, it didn't take long at all to realize, you know, this was a, a divinely appointed visit that I had there because that, that young man wanted to talk. And we got talking about the gospel. He had a little bit of Christian background, way in his background, very driven by his, his, his job and success. And when, I, when we were done, I said, Andrew, I'm telling you, you need to think about eternity. And then, then he left. But, you know, that's to like, you know, that's not a big sacrifice, by the way. But that's the natural inclination that I need my space, my comfort. We're not going to do leadership well if we think that way. We aren't. Okay, Philippians uh, 2, 7 and 8. And it just affirms his sacrifice for us. So I, for yourselves, for me, this is, if we want to be good servant leaders, we just have to be willing to sacrifice and know it's going to be hard lots of times if we're going to really invest in people because we're here to serve others. It's not actually about us. So let's take that. So we, the towel of service, which is often hands-on help, to come alongside people. There's a sacrifice, which is being able to step out of our comfort into situations where I'm going to take the time it takes to help this person through whatever they're going through. And the last one here, if we want to live servant leadership, is a very intentional desire to equip people. To equip. And this is where, in your sphere of influence, you ask this question, am I equipping? Essentially, it's discipling people. But you're equipping them to grow. So if you're, if you're mentoring somebody, you, you, you come alongside and you're helping them to grow. For me, in, in my role, I have this staff that I'm responsible for. It has to be a priority for me that I'm equipping them to do their jobs well, but that I am setting a tone and speaking in, into a tone that they are growing in their walk with God. I can't just hope it happens. I have to be intentional. I think in the context of the church, we have so many people you can be dealing with, so many. But, and sometimes we have to do kind of what, what Jesus did. You know, he, Jesus, he had his three disciples, his 12, and he really invested in the, in the three more than anyone because you can't do everything. But to have that ripple effect of care and equipping. But think about this now. It has to ask the question, am I using my leadership position to help people to grow, to help them to grow in their faith, to help them to grow, do better at their job, to help them just to be better people. You know, if we, it's so easy just to forget that and just to hope it happens. A leader cannot do that. What would, so I put this question here. What does that look in your context? Like, how would that look? Maybe somebody could give, could give a couple, three examples. How are you equipping or sacrificing, towel service, these things. How is that playing out in, the, in your context? Because some of this is business here, some of this is uh, church leadership, but all of your influencers, can, would you be willing to share an example how this would look in your context? Got to get some, some teeth into this so we don't miss why it's so important. Boy, that's such such good wisdom. <laughs> it, it, it's a decision to do something. Sometimes it just falls in your lap, and you have to decide, am I going to do anything about it? But we, and I'll talk about this later, but leaders have to have a panoramic perspective. And it seems, means you get the big picture faster than most people do because there's more things at, at play than just the immediate. And we have to be good at the panoramic. And that's... And that's Keeping our ears to the ground. One, one, that's something I had to learn early in leadership is to keep my ears to the ground because 
I hadn't done it very much. I just it was so green. And I started to realize I have to pay attention to the staff. And then I started to pick up certain things. A couple of staff, so I could say, you know what? All I have to look was their eyes. They may not say anything that anything was wrong, but they just had eyes that said something's off. You know people like that probably, right? They're just the way they are. And it, it's, it's not a negative thing. It's just that when I see, I said, I have to do something about that. I can't just sit and hope. I have to ask, how, did, how are you doing? How are you doing? And then you usually find out you, you can intervene, you can help. But I, you have to be, you have to be, take that initiative. You have to be intentional to watch for those things. Not just sit and scrutinize every person around. That'll drain you of all your energy. But just be alert. Any other examples? Absolutely. Know, know your sheep, yeah. yeah. And, it, and it takes effort to know them, though, doesn't it? Do you find, I, I'm just curious, in this, in this community, is visiting natural, visiting each other in each other's homes? That's one of the things when we left to go down to Pamburn from Osler, we live north of Saskatoon, the, the hospitality, it was just like, you could just phone someone, hey, we're coming over. You didn't have to make big arrangements. You just go visit. And we were so used to that. Then we went down south. It was a different culture. There was way less uh, of that kind of intentionality. It was a, it was a great treat. I, I think it had to do something with Mennonite culture, I think. I'm not sure. But, man, it was good. How, how does that play out here? Yeah, it feels good when somebody says, hey, can I come over and visit? Yeah, come on over. People do do that very often in our area. It happens some, but way more, we're more accustomed to it in, in the setting where we were as a young married couple. Well, these are important things, and I encourage you to really ponder this in your own leadership setting. Are you, are you taking up the towel of service? Are you quick to serve and help people? Serve with a purpose so to help them grow, not just to do a task, help them grow? Are you willing to sacrifice your time and energy to make a difference in people's lives like Jesus did? And are, you with the, are your goals to help equip them and give them tools to grow and disciple them to become more like Jesus? And it may be just teaching th- principles from the Word of God. It may be just coming, helping along with family life. Who knows what it is? Those are all things that I think you want to see servant leadership in action. I think these are some good kind of handles to grab onto. Okay, let's do a little brainstorming here. <laughs> You're kind of spread out. I think what I'm going to do, if you don't mind, it's, it's not great group work, but maybe with a couple of people next to you, you can just chat a little bit. And then I'm going to get you to, to, to do this with this, this passage of Scripture. So you've got to visualize this. This is such a bizarre scene when you think about this. So let me read it to you. So this is, this is from the uh, book of Mark. Jesus is healing people. He's in this house. And then it says here, and it says, Immediately many gathered together so that there was no more room to receive them, not even the door. He preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they'd broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. And when Jesus saw their face, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins have been forgiven. Now just try to imagine this picture. So I was checking with Murray Heber, who does a lot of archaeology stuff in Israel. I said, so how thick was that, that roof they dug through? <laughs> Just picture this. Like, all of a sudden, you're here scraping up there. We're gathered here. Jesus is here. And all of a sudden, the stor- things start, the plaster starts to fall down. And here, this whole hole opens up. And they had to be a big hole because they had to let this guy down. And anyways, he, he said it was pro- probably about 10 inches thick or so. It was quite thick. And they dig through this because they're determined to help their friend and bring him to Jesus. Now, I, when you look at this, I think we can highlight some great leadership qualities that these four men demonstrated. So just with somebody close to you, 
just chat a little bit. What would be some of these qualities? And I'll put them up on the board because I, th I think these guys model for us some great things of what leadership looks like. And uh, so just, just do that. And we'll, I'll just give you a few minutes and then we'll brainstorm together. But I think we can draw some great stuff out of this. Just turn my phone off, sorry. Does that all work? I think so. Because you'll see it's yeah. suffer by five, so it's over that. Well, we don't have lunch plans, though. We could, but so we can have lunch with me? Yeah. Okay. And then I, I don't know where Benny and Pauline live, so I just have to ask her. Can we not go in the car and ride? Yeah. Yeah, good. Sure, that'll be fine. Yep, yep, you bet. Just tell Linda then.
Well, do you, do you want a little more time or are you good to go? You, are you good? All right. So we have this, this uh, picture or this story in, in Mark. I, I'll just list some of these qualities that you have have identified down here. So we have a list of some what would be good servant quali leadership qualities that help to remind us how we look at ourselves. And then the second question is, how did they demonstrate servant leadership? And do we glimpse the distinction between servanthood and servant leadership? Don't ever get the sense that servanthood is not a wonderful thing. It's absolutely a wonderful biblical thing to do. What I want to is to transfer it into the context of leadership and make sure that there is some differences there. So what are some traits that you came up with these fellas? Aha, yeah, faith. Uh -huh, faith, you bet. <laughs> yeah, that's actually awesome. I'm going to put the three-legged stool. Okay, that's great. All three of those are at play, absolutely. I've never thought of it. That's really good insight. What are the things you pick up with these these men? Resolve, yeah. 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 Does this say something about leadership? Not very few things come easily, do they? You have to work at it and you have to be determined. And you have to be resolved because if you just give up right away, it's just gonna get it's what's gonna happen. You get nothing for nothing. So they resolved, they had a, a plan. Yes, that's a great one. Caring, yep, yeah, you bet. Yes. That's a very, very important one. Any others you can pick up on? Yeah. <laughs> can you think that there might be some upset people? <laughs> I just, you just try to visualize this. There had to be some people like, what are you idiots doing? And there may be plaster falling on their head. People are getting hurt. But these guys were resolved. I, mean, I don't know what happened. It does, the Bible's not very detailed on it. Can I put courage there or not fear? Like, and or, I think both are courage did not fear man. Very, very important. I was just explaining to Barney that was wondering if the owner of the house was one of the four men. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's the mystery, I know. Like, what about the owner of this house? Like, somebody came to your house and Jesus is there, they're, they're a bit far your house, there might be some hard feelings come out of this. <laughs> I, you know, the Bible just doesn't say it. Uh, so you kind of have to wonder, but we don't need to create things that were not there. But yeah, it, it's just a real curiosity, though. Anything else you can think of here? Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I would expect so, yeah. Yeah, very, very good point. Yeah, absolutely. Any, that's great. Anything else? It doesn't say, but they must have to have some tools to get through there. Like, I don't think you do it with your bare hands. Yeah. <laughs> All right, any, anything else here that you'd want to add? Any, anyone else want to add to that? It's a really good list. I think another one, I think this is, this is the same here. Initiative. 
I think, but that's really taking action initiative are, I think, are really parallel to each other. Um, anything else you can add to it? Okay, let's look at this question then. How did they demonstrate servant leadership? And what's the distinction between servanthood and servant leadership in this particular story? Took action, yeah. No, it doesn't, yeah. No, I think that is that's really critical. See, I think so many people don't s understand that you can serve and serve well by taking action and, and step into even messy situations that could come at a real cost. But that's, that's leadership. The passive sit back, they'll be glad to help anybody, but they won't necessarily take any action that would cost, come at a cost to them. And I think this is where you start to see that distinction. And each of you in your own world and what you face, and, I, and what I face, I have to ask this, I'm mean, willing, not just to help somebody, but actually come alongside them, even if it comes at quite a cost, to help them move forward, to get help for them, to help them grow. And, I, you know, leadership tends to, you have people around you that you have direct influence on. Are they going to know, man, this person cares about me? And they're going to take action when I'm in trouble. And they start to learn that that kind of leadership is available to them. I think, I, I, to me, that's a really important to know the, the, the two beautiful things, but what separates leaders then? Does this make sense, or is, do, I, do we need to talk more about it? Is that, is that clear? Okay. So let's try something now. That's what kind of stay in your groups there. I wasn't sure if you like group work or not, so I was kind of taking a little risk here that you're okay <laughs> to, to brainstorm together. I think you're okay doing that. So I'm going to give you a, a sorry. I'm going to give you a case study here. This is now fairly, would be fairly uh, relevant, I think, to what you might face. I don't know. So someone in your circle of leadership and influence is not reaching their potential and they are becoming hindrance. We know that's very likely and very possible, right? That scenario. What do you as a servant leader do? You just go up and say, you're fired, I'm tired of you? What, what, is there maybe a better option? <laughs> okay, just talk about your group a little bit. Like, I'd like to see your, how you would respond to that. I think it helps to put some, some flesh around what we're talking about. You know, uh, just stop for a second. Would you like to take a break first? Or do you want to do this and then we'll take a break? Take a break? Okay, we'll do that. Sorry, gosh. Oh, good, thank you.
So what are we doing? Do you want to, are you ready to talk about it or you need a little more time? You're good? Do you need more time? Okay, we'll give a couple of minutes, sir. Peter, how was your, your energy level? How do you find your energy level? Um, Body goes through pretty traumatic. Oh, yeah, that's huge. Wow. Yeah. So, trying to remember things that uh, oh, it'll come back. It's just taking yeah. a while. Yeah. So, then I went to see the doctor and uh, I flew to the bottom and I was probably just trying yeah. to. Yeah, yeah. So, that's quite good. You know? Yeah, good. So, yeah. yeah, good. Okay. All right. You know what? If you want to keep talking, you can, but if you're done, why don't we take a coffee break and let's aim for 10 after by that clock, so it's about 12 minutes, and then we'll keep going again. I'm not sure if that clock's right, but we'll, we'll use it as our guide. <laughs>
Great. So you had a chance to uh, look at this case study. I'll just open it up. How would you deal with this situation? And I think, actually, I'll, t tonight in my Bible characters class, we're going to use the story of David and Nathan where someone had to step into David's life to bring correction. And so many times we're scared to step in when we should step in. It's our calling, our responsibility. But I think leadership that evidence gives evidence of leadership when a person now somebody who's not a leader can easily do that as well but a leader needs to say you know that it, I, this is worth it for me to come alongside this person so i can help them steer them back and, and help them see and and pe people you don't know how people respond of course but yeah any other thoughts that's, that's that gentleness important you don't go in with guns blazing and blast them I think gentleness goes way further. Yeah. Yeah. See, I think that's a really good point as well, is sometimes we think we know what's going on, but we actually don't. And it's way better to start conversations with questions than with accusations or pointedness. Find out, let them explain themselves so there may be way more that we're not even seeing, right? So very good point. Ask questions, do it carefully with gentleness. What are some other things that maybe you identified to, to do this? And don't, don't text them. <laughs> no, I tell you, the written word can do more damage, even if it's well-intended. Every time you can talk in person, especially face-to-face, -face, at the very least on the phone, you can bypass so many hurdles because the written word just can be so misunderstood. And uh, everything in the writing can come back to bite you because it just may have been written poorly with good intent. Yeah, great, great insight, you guys. Is there anything you want to add to this? Yeah, and, it's, and, and some of it may be just the person may not be aware of it. They just need to be brought alert that there's something's off. If it's sin, that's another issue. Because the hindrance may not be sin. Just maybe they're just not, they're acting out of whatever. But if it's a sin issue, then there's another, there's, that also has to be addressed. Where they have to understand, you know, what you're doing is actually sin. And... Uh, I'm not going to go into that now, but tonight I'm going to really try to unpack that, how important it is when you're talking to somebody and helping them come back to Jesus, especially if they're wandering, that they have to understand the reality of this is sin that you're committing, and you have to turn away from your sin. 
and we don't do that well or easily, do we? But it's necessary. It's our calling as believers and leaders to do that. So not just leaders, everybody. Well, thank you for your input. That's really, that's great. Let's, um, let's go here. Just a few comments on perceived and real challenges of servant uh, leadership. We talked about this yesterday, yesterday because sometimes people think, well, if you're going to serve people and you want to help them along, it's going to be perceived as weak because you're kind of giving, giving them everything they want. It's like, you know, my, my son wants to say, you know what, I think it'd be cool to go jump off a cliff and see what happens. You know, and it's a 400-foot cliff. Well, that's ridiculous, right? You're going to say, you're not doing that. And you care for them by stopping them, not just saying, I'm going to give you everything you ask. So you have to know the leadership is caring for people. And often in leadership, people are not even privy to all the things that you know about a situation. And so you won't always be appreciated because you, have, you can't disclose things, right? That just part of what the leadership does. And so you have to be able to say, say to people, there's more going on here, but your care also is saying no. Your care is also directing, say, no, you have to, you have to stop this. And you, that's how you're caring for them. It's not weak. But what happens is when it becomes like a, a power trip, that's where it just goes off and you lose your voice so quickly. So my son, uh, uh, actually he works at the Miller campus. He's on our facility. He's a carpenter. But he, he was coaching soccer teams and they're, they're, he's struggling with the, uh, with, with the guys, just their focus this year. And, and I, I, I haven't seen it. I just, somebody's told me, and he didn't say this to me, but somebody else did. So the, the captain feels he has to speak up to everything to try to bring correction when there's things that are off, right? And what happens is you lose your voice really quickly if you speak too quickly and too often. And you think, I have to be always vocal. And you have to pick and choose your time and space when you speak, when you don't speak. And you have to set the example that gives you the credibility and the voice that when you, when you come to somebody, that they'll listen to you. But we all know there's a, it's two-sided. And you can come with the most caring perspective and attitude and people will not accept it and they'll be angry at you. But at least make sure we, from our, if we're doing the, the encouragement or trying to help this person along to grow, that we do it in the right way. Their response is still their responsibility. That's not ours. Servant leadership strives to care for people first, but this sometimes means making decisions that are not appreciated or understood, like the parent who cares for their child. It means being unpopular, even when your care is not accepted. So you can be very caring and not be very popular for a while because your leadership perspective realizes you have to do this for the care of the bigger body, for the person. And I think any one of you would, would relate to that well. Here's a few thoughts. Servant leadership does not allow one to abdicate his or her leadership responsibility to define the mission, set the rules governing behavior, set standards, define accountability. The servant leader does not commission a poll, conduct a committee meeting, or have a democratic vote to determine the answers to these questions. So you have in your role and title, you do have an authority to say no these kind of questions, the, the governing principles of somebody, so let, I'll use our, our uh, for Miller as an example because it's just my context. If, if uh, one of our teachers comes to me someday and he says, you know what, of course, Bible teaching is our main focus, right? I, I don't think I'm going to teach the Bible anymore in my classes. I'm going to go down, down another trail. What would I as a servant leader say to him? Do I need to go ask commission a poll to see are we going to be okay with this? No, I'm guarding the vision of the school. And it's a very simple answer. Well, then you probably don't need, you can't be here. I don't, I, you know, it, 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 it would be such a sad situation if that was reality. But that's, that's part of the, depending on your role, your responsibility, you have a responsibility to guard it. And there's some things that are very clear and cut and dry. No, that's, if that's heresy or that's whatever, you have, you have a response to say no, and you care for your organization, your ministry, whatever, by saying no. It does not be mean-spirited, but it can be, needs to be firm. And sometimes you need to bring the team in, depending how complex the question is. But we have to know we have certain responsibilities, and that, and you, that you don't just uh, 
say, well, I got to, oh, I'm going to care for you and let you have a certain opinion here. No, actually, in this one, you're wrong, and you need to know it. The leader often has quite a different understanding, perspective of what's going on than the others in the care, in their care, not privy to. Sometimes leaders have to make decisions that others may never agree with. But then the leader must take responsibility as well for what happens. So, a little side note, if you make a decision that you know you believe is the right decision to make, something goes wrong, don't pass the buck to anybody else. You own it. Um, that's part of, I think, of taking responsibility. Servant leadership cannot lose focus on, cannot just fo or lose focus on one person at the expense of the team. And sometimes you can have one person taking a lot of your time, right? And consuming a lot of time. And there comes a point you have to say, for the betterment of the team, we can't do this anymore for you. We have this plays out on our campus lots where one student just can be draining the deans of so much attention because they just got so much stuff. What we do is we'll work with you, but what's happening is you're, you're infecting so many people, we're not going to lose the rest over one, especially if you're not that interested in, in correcting things. And so it may be a dismissal, it may be you have to make some decisions here what you're going to do. And you face that right in the church and, and all your different contexts, those things will come up. Any thoughts on that before we move on? All right. Here's just some, some things that uh, give a little bit of perspective here. Um, how are we doing in all this? Again, it's a question I keep pushing back. We ask that, ourselves that question. That one there, I'm going to read these prayers, but the um, teaching and talking about leadership is much e easier than putting into practice. Just remember that. I could stand here and we could talk about this stuff. Any, all of you, and I know this, I'm, I, and I told you this earlier, I'm deeply committed to living out what I'm talking to here, but it's hard to do it well. <laughs> Boy, do we need God's help. But I believe it's the right way to do it. Here's a nice prayer, or, or thought, I should say, a, a, rather a thought. A godly leader finds strength by realizing his weakness, finds authority by being under authority, finds direction by laying down his own plans, finds vision by seeing the needs of others, finds credibility by being an example, finds loyalty by expressing compassion, finds honor by being faithful, find great, finds greatness by being a servant. Captures a lot of the stuff we've been talking about, doesn't it? Another one here. This is a prayer. Don't give us blessings. Give us grace to be unquestionably obedient to your every last command and desire. Don't give us status. Give us a place to serve. Don't give us a mansion to live in. Give us a springboard to take God's love to the whole world. Don't give us good jobs. Put us to work. Don't give us pleasure. Give us perspective. Don't give us entertainment. Enable us. Don't give us good salaries. Give us strength to do your will. Our greatest joy in life is pleasing our Lord, and there is no other joy comparable. Again, it's just a, 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 it gives a perspective of what drives the motives, I think, in, in, a, in a servant leader. So now we're going to switch gears, and in my class, this is the main paper that students do, this one, this is my main paper, and I'm not giving you an assignment because you don't need to do assignments. <laughs> you could do it if you want, but I get them to write four, six, maybe eight pages where they reflect on the qualities, the characteristics of God, and what they would like to see play out in their own lives as they reflect on God's what affects you and how you deal with life? Well, for me, a big one would be God's sovereignty, knowing that he is in control of everything. It changes how I view life. So anyway, so then they reflect on God's qualities or his characteristics, and then they reflect on qualities they'd like to develop in themselves, and that's to put some teeth, some meat around, okay, actually essential to being a leader is my view of God. And the higher I view of God and his majesty... How can I possibly put myself on a pedestal? Especially in light of the gospel. Oh, we become small very quickly when our God is big. And so, these, this is when you, that's what a theology of leadership, it's your view of God and how it shapes how you do life, how you do leadership, how you do everything, your family, your business, everything, your, and in your ministries. What is your view of God's word? Is this the final authority for all life and practice? If that's a question mark for you, then 
I, that's something you have to wrestle through, but I firmly believe this, is, this book was given for all life and practice. It has everything we need to do life. It's so relevant. And uh, if we have a low view of God's word, it's going to affect how we do life in the Christian life. And I don't even know for sure how you move forward with it if, if you pick and choose what you want out of there. What characteristics of God help to define leadership? There's so many. His love, his majesty, his sovereignty, his omniscience, all these, these characteristics, his patience, his faithfulness, all these, if you start to wrestle, we're not going to take time to do that, but these are things that you can work through. What personal qualities are key to how you would like to lead? One of the common ones when I get papers back from students is they want to be able to show the love that God has for them to be able to express that love for people because people are not very lovable. Let's face it. Generally, they aren't. Right? And so with God's help, help me to love people the way God loves them and to mo model that. The centrality of the gospel is absolutely key to this. Barriers, again, I'm just outlining some of the things that we do in this paper. What are the barriers to living out these qualities? And often it arises out of our own pride or our unwillingness to learn or to grow. So these are, these are the, uh, just introducing the theology of leadership. Now we're going to look at some verses that really express the Bible's description of our sovereign God. But before we do that, we're going to watch a video. Have any of you watched any Louis Giglio videos before? There's some of you? I've watched this one several times. And, uh, and he talks about the expanse of the universe. Like we have it right in front of our eyes, so to speak. <laughs> but we forget it easily, right? We don't, we, the immensity of the universe is just crazy. And when we see that, we start to become very small when we realize that God breathed it into existence. So I, want, it's, it's a, I think it's a really worth watch. I've watched it many times. Every time I watch it, I'm just humbled. I said, man, wow. So let's watch that together. And uh, I'll see if I can get it rolling here. Um, Yes, that's, that's the one we're going to watch, yeah. I just love the, the description of it. I'm going to put it there just a little bit. Okay. So there's no sound coming through here. Okay. Again, and that the view that we have of God will be expanded in this place tonight, and that we will leave here with the confidence that He is able to hold on to us and hold us together no matter what circumstances come our way in this lifetime. And if you were with us uh, on the indescribable tour, we sort of took a swing at that first part, looking at the bigness of God and the greatness of. of God. Their expanse declares the work of his hands. In other words, all you have to do is look up and you see the size of the God that we're worshiping tonight. We ended that. Just a little review. With this galaxy right here, the Whirlpool Galaxy, you're like, man, why? We're talking about astronomy at a Christian worship service. Why not? The God that we're worshiping tonight is the one who created that right there. It's called the darling of astronomy. The reason why is it's sitting completely perpendicular to us on Earth. And when we look up at it, we get this beautiful view. But check this out. The Whirlpool Galaxy is 31 million light years away from where you're sitting right now. Okay, they got nothing in here tonight. 31 million light years away. That's just the first little thing we got to catch up with tonight. By the way, the story opens like this. In case you forgot, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he said, let there be light, and there was light. And that was a phenomenal moment when that happened because light came out of the mouth of God traveling 186,000 miles a second. That's how fast light is traveling through the universe. And so a light year, therefore, is 
how far light travels in one year, and I'll do the math for you, it's 5.88 trillion miles is a light year. So as we talked about before, when you start to get around in the neighborhood of God, the mile is not going to help you. The yardstick, the ruler, the tape measure, these things are of no value in the universe that God has made. We're using a ruler called a light year that's 5.88 trillion miles long. And if you'd like to go to the Whirlpool Galaxy, be my guest. All you have to do is multiply 31 million, that's how many light years it is away, by 5.88 trillion miles, and that's the distance that you've got to cover. A anybody with me so far? I'm, I'm wondering, are there any science lovers here tonight? Because we're going to have a little scientific content tonight, and I need to know if anybody's going to be with me so far. So you do the math, or you could look at it a different way. You just have to travel 186,000 miles a second for 31 million years, and voila, you will arrive at the Whirlpool Galaxy. Second thing that's pretty stunning, given that our God made that, is it contains 300 billion stars in that one galaxy, 300 billion stars. And it is one of hundreds of billions of other galaxies in the known universe that God has made. And it just reminds us all over again tonight, man, this God that we're singing to tonight, he's enormous. He's bigger than anything we've ever dreamed of. He's bigger than our wildest imagination of him. But we ended by looking inside that thing, and this is pretty stunning. Those of you who've seen it remember, but the Hubble Space Telescope is circling the Earth at 360 miles above the Earth, and it takes amazing images of these galaxies and other phenomenon of, of the cosmos, and it looked into that white core of the Whirlpool Galaxy, and lo and behold, there is a black hole in there. And we'd never seen it before until Hubble could take an image of it, and I found this on NASA's site, hubblesite.org. This is what... Hubble sent back to us from 31 million light years away from the black hole core of the Whirlpool Galaxy. They send us back this image right here, and it's just crazy. It's crazy. It's the glory of God, the grandeur of God. It's the grace of God and the mercy of God everywhere we look. It's the imprint of God in all of creation everywhere we turn. And tonight we just want to begin with the bigness of God, the, the grandeur of God all over again. We're going to do it by looking at four stars. Can, can you handle four stars tonight? The first one's easy because there's just one star in our solar system, and that star is called the sun. Thank you very much. Yes, it's our own star. It's, uh, there's an image of it for you, by the way. It's a little more fierce than we often think. It's 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface, but what I want you to see about it is how big it is. It's 93 million miles away, so when you're looking up in the sky, it's pretty good pace out there. By the way, light traveling 186,000 miles a second, it's only taken eight minutes to cover that 93 million mile journey to touch your skin here in Atlanta, Georgia. But what I want you to see is the size of it. It's like a million times the size of the earth, and that matters to us tonight when you hear what the psalmist said. Listen to his words. By the word of the Lord, this is Psalm 33, the heavens were made. In other words, God didn't lift a finger when he made the universe. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. But he goes on to say, their starry hosts by the breath of his mouth. So we're looking at something so intense that we don't want to get any closer than 93 million miles away, which is what we are right now. And then we read that God just breathes out stars. It's crazy to think about it. A million times the size of the earth. So here's a little perspective that sort of changed my life. If the earth were the size of a golf ball, okay, the sun would be 15 feet in diameter. Okay, that didn't seem to move anybody either, so let me try it a different way. Let me just try it just a different way. I thought I might need this, so I brought a golf ball, okay? So all through the evening, this is going to represent Earth, all right? So this is where we are. I need everybody in the building to look as closely as you can and find yourself, okay? And when you've found yourself, I want you to nod your head so that I know you've located you on the Earth, okay? You're nodding your head? Okay, you found yourself. If the Earth were a golf ball, the sun would be 15 feet in diameter. That's not 15 feet in diameter. Can we blow that up just a hair and maybe give them 15 feet in diameter? So here's a little perspective for you, okay? Is this working for anybody? Here we are on the Earth, and that's the sun. It's so big, it's so big, you could put 960,000 Earths 
inside the sun. So if the earth were a golf ball and the, and the sun were 15 feet in diameter, you could put 960,000 golf balls inside that 15 foot diameter sun. That's enough golf balls, by the way, because I know that seems like a big number, to fill a school bus with golf balls could fit inside the 15 foot in diameter sun. It's a massive star and it's one of hundreds of billions of stars in the Milky Way galaxy, our cul-de-sac in the neighborhood called the cosmos that God has made. It's huge, and we're worshiping a star-breathing God tonight. But I want to tell you about the second star, okay? Because the second star absolutely wrecked my life. I heard about it when I was a high school student here in Atlanta. One of our youth leaders did a talk, and he mentioned this star. I didn't know how to talk to God for about two months after I heard about this star. It's called Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse. You can pick your pronunciation. I'm obviously going with Betelgeuse, and Betelgeuse is incredible. Here it is in the night sky. I know it doesn't look incredibly ferocious, but it's 427 light years away. So that's 427 times 5.88 trillion miles away from us right now. Draw it in a little closer with the Hubble Space Telescope, and you can start to get a little bit of the feeling of its intensity. But this is the crazy thing about Betelgeuse. Are you ready for this? Betelgeuse is twice the size. Are you ready? You think I'm going to say twice the size of the sun? Oh, no. It's twice the size of the Earth's orbit around the sun, Betelgeuse is. It's crazy. If the Earth were a golf ball, <laughs> Betelgeuse would be the height of six Empire State Buildings on top of each other. Now, come on. Have you seen the Empire State Building? <laughs> I mean, maybe what you're going to need to do is gather the family, get a golf ball, get some plane tickets, and fly up to New York. And you're going to go into Midtown, you're going to take your golf ball and put it on the sidewalk outside the Empire State Building. Don't worry about people thinking you're crazy. They're not even going to notice you in New York. You're going to go across the street, you're going to look up at the Empire State Building and imagine five more Empire State Buildings on top of the Empire State Building. That's Beetlejuice, and that's the Earth, and somewhere you're on it. You could fit 262 trillion Earths inside Betelgeuse. So if the Earth were a golf ball, that would be enough golf balls to fill up the Superdome with golf balls. 3,000 times. <laughs> when I heard that as a teenager, that stumped me right there. Because most of my praying had been advising God, correcting God, <laughs> suggesting things to God, drawing diagrams for God, <laughs> reviewing things with God, counseling God. The third star, let's just, can you go a little bit bigger with me? The third star is called Musifi. Here it is in the night sky. It's that gold star to the top left. We, we have the big image of it. It's 3,000 light years away, but I just want you to see it in the, in the span of all these little glittering star so that you know that at times when you look up at night it is not just twinkle twinkle little star how I wonder what you are I'm telling you what you are what you are is intense and huge and massive and ferocious is what you are and, and this one used to be called Herschel's Garnet Star check it out if the earth were a golf ball <laughs> Musifi would be the width of two Golden Gate bridges end to end Apparently, you're going to need to go from New York to the West Coast. Go to San Francisco with your family and your golf ball. Place your golf ball at the beginning of the Golden Gate Bridge. Go across the bay into Oakland to a high place where you can see the entire Golden Gate Bridge. Another second Golden, Break, Go Golden Gate Bridge will be in your imagination. Span all the way back the two Golden Gate Bridges to the very beginning and find your golf ball over there. That's the Earth and somewhere you're on it. One of the stars in the Milky Way galaxy. It's so big you could fit 2.7 quadrillion Earths inside this one star. Thank you so much. Where have you been all night? Now, quadrillion we have not talked about, and I need to explain this just briefly because I don't know about you, but I do not understand the national debt or any numbers bigger than about $875.28. I get that number. Go bigger than that, I don't know. But you need to understand a quadrillion, okay, because this star is crazy big. 
A quadrillion. Uh, let's do it this way. Everybody knows a million, right? How many you know what a million is? You can kind of get your head around a million. Everybody? All right. You know that a billion is a thousand million and a trillion is a thousand billion and a quadrillion is a thousand trillion, right? Everybody knew that? Here's the perspective. This changed my life, right? A million seconds ago? Twelve days ago. Isn't that cool? See, that saves you doing that on your little calculator at home, which I dare you to try to do when you get home tonight. But a billion seconds ago, you're thinking, oh my goodness, if it's 12 days ago, I'm going all the way back to like September with you, Louie. This must be crazy, right? How about May 1975 is a billion seconds ago. You're like, whoa, that's a little bit bigger than a million. Oh yeah. A trillion seconds ago, you're like, uh-huh, I'm on the 1800s. No. Christopher Columbus? No. 29,700 B.C. is a trillion seconds ago. A quadrillion seconds ago. 30,800,000 years ago is a quadrillion seconds ago. We're talking about a really large number, and Musifi is so big, you could put 2.7 quadrillion Earths inside this one star. But it is not even the biggest star we have found. I love science. And science has just brought us the largest star they found. It's called, are you ready for this, Canis Majoris. Now, I'm no linguist, but that's a cool name for the biggest star we've found so far. I think that means the big dog star, and that's exactly what it is. I bring it to you as a little bitty purple, you know, glow just to the right of center there. But Canis Majoris, oh, wow. If the Earth were a golf ball... Canis Majoris would be the height of Mount Everest. Thank you. You just saved your family plane fare from California to Kathmandu, Nepal. Almost six miles above sea level, the highest point on the planet, and I just dare you to get up there and unzip the parka and pull out your golf ball. You could fit seven quadrillion Earths inside Canis Majoris. That's enough Earths if the Earth were a golf ball to cover the entire state of Texas in golf balls 22 inches deep. You see the one you're on? Maybe this will help a little bit more. This absolutely blew my mind. Just a little journey through our solar system. Everyone knows our planets and sort of how we fit in to the story here. You see really quickly that we're not even the biggest deal in our own solar system, but as Earth comes by, you have to know tonight that we are living on a privileged planet. Anyone would tell you we're living at one of the most special places, if not the most special place in all of creation. But Neptune comes by and Saturn and then Jupiter and you're like, okay, we're not all that big, even in our own little cul-de-sac. I just noticed the blue dot fading away is not the Earth. That's Neptune. The Earth has gotten too small to see anymore. Sirius comes by. Little plug for satellite radio. Not the biggest star, but the brightest star that we have found so far. Pollux, which we didn't mention. Arcturus. Such a beautifully named one, Regal. But then the one that messed me up. Our third star, Musifi. Musifi's cousin, W. Sifi. Majoris.
And do you know that you couldn't come up here right now with a Sharpie and make a mark on the screen that would approximate the size of our sun? You couldn't even do it. I mean, when you look at these and their relative size, we just have to put a little arrow over there that says, if you could put the sun on here, which you can't, it would go somewhere about here. And um, can you hang on that for me? And when you see this, I don't know what happens to you, but I'll tell you what happens to me. A shrinking feeling comes over me, and it's not a bad shrinking feeling. It's a good shrinking feeling. Because sin, it has a, a way of shrinking God down in our minds and puffing us up in our own estimation. But just a glance into the universe that God has made resizes everything in a heartbeat. And you realize tonight we are worshiping an unrivaled, uncontested God of all kind of might and power and glory and awe who is, there's none like him anywhere in all of creation tonight. We are not here worshiping some little teeny tiny God. We are the teeny tiny ones, you and me. We are small and weak and fragile and frail. We are, you and me tonight, one of six and a half billion people on this little golf ball sized planet in this massive universe that God has made. But I'll tell you the miracle of tonight is, is crazy and crazier to me than the size of any star is that though we are but a vapor, you and me, and tiny and frail, we are marked by majesty. And we have been created in the very image of the God who breathes out the stars and put the universe into place. You and I are fashioned and formed and ordained by the God of all creation. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, you and I. We are a miracle. You're a miracle sitting in the building tonight. If I could just remind you just for a moment, you are somebody incredibly special. Let me just dial back to the beginning, and I, I know you know this already, but in the very, very beginning, here's how you happened, okay? One cell from your mom found one cell from your dad. Now, there's more involved in that than that, but that's enough for us right now. And by the way, we should applaud the one cell from your dad because that one cell did a pretty heroic thing to be the one cell in the story that we're talking about tonight. One cell from your mom met up with one cell from your dad, each one carrying 23 chromosomes. The one from your mom was carrying half of her DNA. The one from your dad was carrying half of his DNA. And those two cells met and merged into one single cell. And when they did, those chromosomes matched, and they began to form together a brand new DNA code using four characters, four nucleotides, they begin to write out what we have now discovered is the three billion character description of who you are written in the language of God. They wrote out your DNA, your human genome of three billion characters made up of those four simple nucleotides. And when they did, they described who God had ordained you to be. In that one little simple cell, scientists say if you took the DNA out of that one little cell and stretched it out, that DNA would be six feet long, three billion characters stretched out to six feet long. So amazing that if I were to read your DNA, reading one character per second, night and day, it would take me 96 years just to read the description of you. And when they formed together, they wrote out and painted a picture which had never been written before in the history of humankind. And then that cell did the unthinkable. It set out to build that model from one cell. I'm telling you, you are a miracle sitting in this building tonight. And you have come a long, long way. I mean, here you are, this may not be in the family photo album, but here you are at three days old. 16 cells of you. You say, what in the world is that? 
It's a 16-cell human embryo on the tip of a safety pin at incredible magnification. So by now, that one cell had turned into 16 cells on its way to making the 75 trillion cells that make up your body tonight. Every one of those 75 trillion cells containing that six feet of the three billion character DNA code that you. There's so much DNA in your body, by the way. If you stretched it all end to end, there'd be enough DNA to go to the moon and back inside your body. 178,000 times. That's how amazing God has made you to be. 75 trillion cells in your body. And when I told you that, 50,000 of those cells died and were replaced by brand new cells when I told you that. And then just now, 50,000 more cells died and were replaced by brand new cells. It's happening every three seconds, day and night, all the days of your existence. And you wonder why you're tired all the time. I'll tell you, you're doing some amazing stuff night and day. We're miracles, you and me. I love the way Augustine said it. One of the great fathers of the church and of the faith. He just nailed it when he said it like this. Men go abroad to wonder at the height of mountains, the huge waves of the sea, the long course of rivers, the vast compass of the ocean, the circular motion of the stars, but they pass by themselves and they don't even notice. In the womb, miracles happening every moment. Here you are at five months in the womb. You remember those days? Those were the good old days. <laughs> and just miracles happening every second. Let me tell you about one. Million optic nerve endings left the optic nerve center of your brain in the womb, headed for a million optic nerves that had left your eye. And they had to meet and match their exact partner, one million looking for one million. And when they found their exact partner out of a million and matched up together, in that instant you had sight. And anyone would tell you that to this moment, the most technologically advanced thing on planet Earth is your eye. Oh, but it didn't do you any good because when that moment happened, you just had one piece of skin completely covering your eyeball. But as I read in one textbook, miraculously and mysteriously at about the sixth month, a little cutting device appeared and it cut perfectly that piece of skin. And you had eyelids for the very first time in your mother's womb. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And the God of the heavens is the one who fashioned you together. And he knows your name tonight. And he knows every single thing there is to know about you and he's made you a promise that for those who trust in him he will literally hold them in his hand and carry them all the days of their life this Psalm 33 that talks about a star breathing God turns an interesting corner it says for he spoke and it came to be he commanded and it stood fast. That's power and awe. But now it gets very personal. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of them all and is intimately acquainted with everything they do. And then he goes even further. And he says the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him on those who hope in his unfailing love, and here comes his promise, to deliver them from death and to keep them alive in famine. 
And that is the promise tonight, because this building and our world is filled with hurting people, with lives that are spinning out of control, with pain that we, don't, we didn't ask for or could never imagine. And God is making a promise to us tonight. He's saying, I am a universe maker, and I am a heart former, but I'm also big enough to be intimately acquainted with all the circumstances of every one of your lives. And I promise you, no matter what comes in this lifetime, no matter how difficult the road or how dark the night, I will hold on to you and I will literally hold you together and carry you through any and every circumstance that ever comes your way any moment on this planet. It's the promise of God. And you say, well, man, that sounds good, but how do I know that's true in my life right now, Louis? I mean, that's really what we want to know tonight. And I'll tell you how you can know tonight that God will always hold you together no matter what. It's by looking a little deeper into the human body. And it's a little protein molecule called laminin. Yeah, that's about what I felt the first time I heard that. Long story short, the tour was winding down. Last time around, we were in Tyler, Texas. The night was over. A guy walks up to me. I wish I could tell you the whole story. It was so of God. Introduces himself to me. He says, how are you doing? I just want to say hello. I said, it's nice to meet you. He says, you guys winding the tour down. Uh, where are you going to go from here? I said, well, I'm on my way back home to Atlanta, Georgia. He said, well, what's next for you? I said, I'm going to be preaching the next two Sundays for my pastor back in Atlanta. He said, oh, cool. What are you preaching on? I said, well, the series is on the glory of God in the human body. He said, that's really amazing. I'm a molecular biologist at the university down the road. G give me your talk. And I was like, oh, wow. I wasn't quite yet ready to unload the talk for a molecular biologist. So I kind of stumbled through what I had and he's kind of being kind and gracious and like, uh-huh, that's good. And then he says, well, what's your big left hook? You gotta have a left hook, a big finish, right? I said, I don't have a left hook yet. He said, oh, Louie, oh man, your left hook is laminin. And I'm, I'm totally blank on laminin. He goes, Louie, it's a cell adhesion molecule, protein molecule. Do you know about proteins? I'm like, no. He said, Louis, cells organize into certain molecular structures, and that determines what protein there are. There are between 10 and 60,000 proteins in the human body. We don't even know how many proteins are in the human body. But one of them is a cell adhesion molecule. It's organized into this certain structure, and that tells the cell what its job is in the body. And this one is a cell adhesion molecule. And I'm like, all right. He said, no, Louie, it's like the rebar of the human body. The steel they put in the concrete when they lay the foundations of things, it's that stuff. It's, it's holding your membranes together. It's the glue of the human body, Louie. It's laminin. You've got to tell them about laminin. And I'm like, I promise you, I'm going home and tell them about laminin. And I'm sure when I do, revival is going to sweep across the church and probably around the world when I tell them. He said, no, 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 no. You've got to see laminin. Like, okay, let's see it. He said, no, 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 you need to go look it up online. You need to go Google laminin. I don't even know how to spell laminin. <laughs> Takes his card out, he writes on the back, L-A-M-I-N-I-N. I'm like, okay, I cannot wait to get to my computer and get on Google, click on images, type in laminin, and I'm waiting, and these little thumbnails come up on the screen, and I'm like... Myself. I cannot believe what I'm seeing. I love laminin. I'm so fired up. You should see laminin, I guess. That's the thing, right? Okay. Here is a scientific diagram of the laminin cell adhesion molecule that's holding your body together right now. Okay, this is what I found right here. That's crazy. That's just crazy. I just can't believe it. I emailed a guy 
got back so fast, I'm like, wow, 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 what in the world? He said, you want to see an actual laminin molecule? I'm like, oh, no, man, the diagram was cool for me. I'm happy with that. Don't, don't bother sending anything else. I'm like, yes! And he sends me this image, an electron microscopic image of an actual laminin protein molecule. It looks just like this. I'm like, how crazy is that? That the stuff that holds our bodies together, that's holding the lining of your organs together, holding your skin on, is in the perfect shape of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And immediately I'm thinking about the words of Paul in Colossians 1. You know this beautiful passage where Paul's talking about the supremacy of Christ and the sufficiency of Christ. He says, for by him, talking about Jesus Christ, all things have been created, things in heaven and things on earth. All things were created by Jesus and for Jesus. But then the next verse goes on to say this. It's crazy. And he, Jesus, is before all things. And in him, that is, in Jesus Christ, all things hold together. It's right, it's right there. I'm like, of course they do. Of course they do. Everything holds together in Jesus Christ. And he goes on at the end of this paragraph, and he just tells the story of grace. He says, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Christ and through Christ to reconcile to himself all things by making peace through his blood shed on a cross. So you're at the toughest place in your life. How can you know that God is going to to hold you together and bring you through. You know because there is a cross standing over history and it is looming over this building tonight. It is the place where the star breather became the sin bearer. Where the universe maker became mankind's savior. And it is proof that God doesn't always change the circumstances. He did not change them for Jesus on that hillside outside Jerusalem. But the cross is also proof that God always has a purpose in the circumstances and that his purpose and his plan will prevail and will triumph through any circumstances in this world. So we just close with this question. It's found right in the middle of an interesting chapter in Isaiah 40 where it just talks about the expanse of God. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain like a tent to dwell in. He leads forth the starry host one by one and calls them each by name. But then it takes a turn. And the writer of Isaiah says, So why do you say, O Jacob? And why do you complain, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. Or say, my cause is disregarded by my God. In other words, there was a moment in the history of Israel when they felt like God had completely lost sight of them. That yes, I believe that God is big enough to make the world. I even believe that God ordained and made me. And now coming present tense, I'll accept the fact that God gave his son on a cross. But what I really need to know right now, what really matters most to me right now, is does God see what I'm going through? Does he see what I'm carrying? Does he know that I can't take one more step or one more day? Does he care and can he do something? That's what I need to know. And Isaiah answers it. He answers with another question. And it's a question for us here. He says, do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. 
He's huge. He is a star breather. He's big. But listen to what he loves to do. That God, that creator of the ends of the earth, that I do not grow tired or weary, that my understanding is too great for you, that God, here's what he does. He gives strength to the weary and he increases the power of the weak. For even the youths will grow tired and weary and young men will stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord, another translation, those who wait upon the Lord, The Hebrew word simply means this. When it says hope and wait, it means that those who stand right in the midst of the craziness, right in the midst of the pain, right in the midst of the chaos, right in the valley of the shadow of death, and they don't gloss over it. They're dealing with the hardest stuff in life, but standing in the middle of it, they say, you know what? I don't see what God's doing. I don't understand what the plan is, but I'll tell you one thing. I am not going to give up on God, and I'm going to stand right here in the middle of this moment, and I'm going to trust that God is sitting on a throne, that he has a purpose for my life and a plan for my life. And I believe I'm going to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. And I'm not going to stop believing that no matter what. That's what the word means, to wait and to hope in the Lord. And he said, and here's the promise. You're going to wake up to rosy circumstances. No. Oh, he can do that and he does do that. But the promise is greater than that. He said, those who wait upon the Lord, here's what I promise. I will renew your strength. And when you think you can't take one more breath, I'll give you enough to keep going on. And enough to keep going on. And enough to keep going on. And to keep going, and to keep going, and to keep going. You keep hoping, and I'll keep causing strength to rise when you hope. And you'll keep going. And you'll feel like you have been swept up on the wings of eagles. And you will run and not get weary and walk through it all and not faint. He said, I will hold you. Even when you let go of me. I'm not going to let go of you. Did you know there are millions and millions and millions of microscopic crosses holding you together right now? And one giant glorious cross of Jesus Christ that's holding every one of us that's trusted in him on to the heavenly father and holding the heavenly father on to us and it's going to keep holding us on to him that cross forever and ever and ever and ever we will never not be carried by the strong hand of a universe making God and he will bring us through that is the promise of the everlasting God amen Bless you. God bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless Well, how does that, how does that hit you? I was going to ask you. I mean, if, if we, our minds can't even grasp the majesty of God, and his, his ability to be that big, you know, there's a song that says, big enough to rule the universe, but small enough to live within my heart. It, it just, our minds can't grasp this, I don't think, at least mine can't. And I, and I sit in awe of this, so. Any other thoughts, like how does, what does this remind you of, or, you know, let's just reflect a little bit before we move on.
one of, one of the uh, nice er, things of living in the prairies, and you'd see it here, is you can still see the stars. And you know, we look out there, and we just, it's right in front of us. We don't even realize just the absolute immense thing. Every once in a while, we need this kind of reset. At least I do. And then the reason I like to play this video is in the context of the Christian life, we were so bent to elevating ourselves, making much of ourselves, and we see how majestic and powerful God is. And how can we not be humbled? And I, I firmly believe if our view of God is right, it's going to great impact how we lead, because it will be about Him getting the glory. Our motive, our gender, our character will line up, and it will be about others. And so it's. Uh, you know, I, I remember one time, school had just started, it was fall, and the, the freshmen hadn't even arrived yet, but it was already dark, and the upperclassmen were sitting by around a fire, and I could hear them clearly because we were fairly close to them, and, uh, and they were singing that song, How Great Is Our God, and you look up at those stars, and you say, oh, we just get a glimpse of the majesty of God. I hope this encourages you. I, I don't know if it impacts you the same way it does me, but it just reminds me, boy, just get over yourself. <laughs> just get over yourself and remember the, just from the tiniest cell, the majesty of the universe, this is the kind of God we serve and we're privileged. And he loves every one of us more than we can ever describe. And he died for us. And and so that should compel us to want to serve him well and to, to stay the course, not give up, even when we're discouraged. And, you know, and he's, I like he's really realistic about the hardships of life. God doesn't promise to take those from us, but he helps us, he'll journey through with us. And, of course, we have the, the goal of eternity. Well, I think what we, I'd like us to do is just read Scripture together and then we'll move on to a new section just seeing what the time is here. Um, the sovereignty of God, God's sovereignty is the attribute by which he, re, he rules the entire creation. And to be sovereign, God must be all-knowing, all-powerful, and absolutely free. And in my journey of faith, um, I, I went from a, a complex faith where I overcomplicated things because I wanted to know why did this happen? Why? Why? And I wanted answers from God. And somewhere, I think it was in my later 20s, the light suddenly went on where I could just gr come to full acceptance that God is sovereign. And he knows the beginning from the end. He's in control. I don't have to have the answers to these things. Because there's so many things that happen in life. I remember, I remember this when our, our son, Michael, was about six years old. And, and it was just one of those, you know, he, they were out playing outside at the farm close to Hague there, and I wasn't even there. And a big electrical spool, you know, these wooden things that they put the electrical wire around, probably weighed about a couple hundred pounds. He, he, it had fallen, it had rolled over his head. And so he was, like, he was in terrible shape. So it was bleeding out of his ears, and he was just in and out of consciousness. We didn't know where he's at, because I kind of met them, and we just headed to the hospital. And, you know, we, we just didn't know. Is he going to die now, or what? Looked terrible. Well, God spared his life, and he came out with really no repercussions from that, though they were afraid he'd lose an eye and could snap his neck. He just cracked crack the, the brow and everything. And God spared him, and then, and we could just be thankful that God spared him. And then a couple months later, somebody in our church, the, the mom and dad, or the dad, backed over his two-year daughter and killed her. You know, you just, so at this, fu this funeral, this little baby in the coffin, I was saying, God, why? keep our son. This little girl had to die. 
And those are unexplainable things, aren't they? That we've all seen and experienced in various capacities here. And it's in those moments that I, for me personally, I had to come to grips that we won't have answers to those things. And I got to be okay with that. I wanted answers. We didn't deserve it anymore to anybody. But it was a reminder that God is sovereign who knows the beginning from the end. And we have to resolve in our hearts and minds, I believe this firmly, that he is sovereign and he's in control of all things. So from complicating my faith, I, I realized to simplify your faith, the simplicity of the gospel, the truth of the gospel, the truth that God is in control. And there's all these questions that come. And I said, no, go back to God's sovereignty. He is going to accomplish his purposes. The Bible's absolutely clear on that. And now I can be at peace with it. And I think we have to resolve that. And, and out of that actually flows, I think, it affects how we live life. And, I, and I'm sure all of you struggle through various things with this thing, like how God works. But then we have to go back to the bigger picture of God and the bigger picture of eternity and just trust him. And I think he just describes it so well. But let's read some scripture together. Um, he just read from Isaiah. We won't read that whole passage, but if I get somebody to read in Isaiah there, let's move it up a little bit. Um, as I, Isaiah chapter 40. Uh, these, these, uh, these passages in, in uh, uh, Isaiah are just, they just put it all in perspective, I think. So somebody could, maybe we could just go down the road here. Do you mind reading uh, Peter 40, 25 to 31, which he just referred to? And then Isaiah 40, 46, 8 to 11. Isaiah 55, 8 to 11, Daniel uh, 3, 35, what's that? Sorry, 435, what, what did I say? Okay, 435, yeah, that would be quite different thing. Um, and then Romans 11, 33 to 36, and then just Psalm 19, the first couple of verses, because it just kind of captures it. And then finally, uh, Psalm 33, six to nine, which we also just heard from. And let's just listen to the word of God, speak of who God is. And uh, it just affirms, I think, for us, our view of God. Just go ahead. Just keep going here. Okay, Isaiah 46, verse 8. Remember this, O you shall be married. Recall to mind your transgression. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Um, declaring the end from the beginning, and from the ancient Executes my counsel from afar empty. Indeed, I have 
So let the word of the Lord speak, the Bible speak. How can we, if we believe this to be true, how can we be in doubt that he is above everything, he's in control of everything, his ways are higher than our ways? And I like what he said in that thing earlier. He says he used to like to counsel God and instruct God. <laughs> and then all of a sudden he realized, how many times have I, we done that? Oh, I remember a time we had a significant need in our family. We were, we were so hard. We were so broke. And anyway, and we had to do something. You know, I was in university. And I, I remember saying, you know, I was calculating. I, mean, I think we're supposed to figure out what to do. I don't think that's wrong. But I kind of came to this conclusion that we need to move out of the house we were in. And we had to, you know, we had to do something because I just, we couldn't survive with what was going on. And so I came up with four options for God. <laughs> so, well, God, I have four options. Which one are you going to take? <laughs> you know, and the, the absolute foolishness of that thing. And boy, the Lord taught us a lesson. So I'll just give you the quick, real quick story of it because it was just, it's one of those landmark moments where he said, my ways are higher than your ways. Just trust me, I am in control. Instead of trying to always figure it out on your own. Now, we do our part. Don't get me wrong. We have to we use the minds that God's given to us. But boy, let's not limit, it, limit him. So we were, we were in this house in Oldsler. We were paying about, 800 and, oh, about 830, 50 bucks a month. That included rent and our utilities. And I, I was in university. I lost my job, so we really didn't have any income. And we just, it was a tiny little house. Our fourth kid was coming along. And, you know, we, it was, whatever. The size didn't matter at all. That was never the issue. We just couldn't afford it. And, and so the town came to us and said, well, we, you should apply for low income. As a student family, you actually qualify. But it'll take at least a year. So I said, well, what's the point if it's going to a year? That's not going to help us right now. And I said, just apply anyway, because you never know. And it helps us to show interest in the housing we have. So we're in this tiny little house, and it was a month later, we got this call. It said, there's a house available for you. And, and so, you know, I'd done all the calculating, right? Uh, it's going to be a little bit cheaper, at least, than what we are, and it's certainly a much bigger place. It was about 
the house was about 10 years old. Like we had space, like we never know what to use. And our fourth kid was just going to be born. And I still remember sitting in that living room or the kitchen, and he's calculating this, the guy who's going to rent the house to us. And he says, that'll be $33 a month. And he says, and I just, I didn't know what to do except laugh. And that includes all your utilities as well. Because we had no income, apparently. This is their gift to us. We paid for our phone bill and 33 bucks a month. And see, I had the gall to give God options, not thinking that he was already operating a different plane. And what a, what a landmark moment for us to trust him. And he just took care of us till the end of my university. And, and just these verses, boy, did they become real. As the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And we just need to be there in that place because we, we so often reduce God. And Ingram talks about that. We reduce God to make him think like us. By the way, this is a really good book. If you want to take a picture of it, it might be something you're interested in. But So that's kind of my, my encouragement to you in leadership. Allow God to be God as the majestic God who, and we're very small, but he chooses to use us every single person here with a design purpose to serve him. And last night, Bible characters, I talked about, are you con confident con and good with your calling and at peace with your calling? Then give yourself wholeheartedly to what he's called to do. Let be a light where he's placed you. And don't, don't apologize. Just be what you be that light wherever you're working, your business, whatever it is, if you're in, a, in a church leadership, whatever, just, and then, and as we are reduced before God, the bigger he becomes and the less we'll think about ourselves. So I think looking at the time, we haven't taken a break. I, can I give you one more thing to do uh, and then we'll, we'll wrap up for the day. Um, and it's just a practical application of this. I think this is important. Let's say you're on a search committee on your church or Christian organization or any, and it would be probably more where you're hiring a Christian in this case, believing that a person's view of God is foundational to how they will lead, what questions would you ask to gain understanding about that person's viewpoint? And what other evidences would you look for to know that this person you're hiring has a high view of God? I personally think, and, and again, I think we would all agree, if a person does not have a right view of God, you do not want to hire them. So I think it's, it's, it's important for us to ask the right questions, to search that out, to have them express what is your true view of who God is, the God of the Bible, and can you articulate that in some way so we know, yes, they, this person has the right view of God. I don't know if you think that's an important question to ask if you're interviewing. I think it is. Because I think you start to get to the heart of who the person really is. So we can either just brainstorm for a little bit here. We don't have to get into groups. Um, maybe that's what we should do just before we wrap up. Um, is it an important question, or would you, would you consider that a valid question if you're interviewing somebody? You know, I, I think it is, but how would, you, how, would you, how would you draw that out of someone to, to get a sense of who, who God is to them? What would be some questions? Let's just, let's just brainstorm together. personal story yeah and a testimony is very revealing of how people view God and I'm I really feel strongly about this we like to put people on a pedestal who comes from horrendous situations and experience the miracles of God and it's good to hear from people who come out of being a drug addict or whatever terrible circumstances and God's changed their lives and that is the beauty of God's miracle in their life and is a great story and we should tell it but i've also told people who have no big story to tell just had sort of a normal life but they have encountered christ and our new creation said if you understand your depravity 
if we understand our depravity, everyone has an amazing story to tell. Don't ever apologize for, well, I only grew up in a Christian home and I kind of... Don't ever apologize because you don't understand your own depravity. And if they can express that understanding of God's grace and miracle in their life and understand and articulate the gospel, I think you start to get a good sense of who their view of God is. Any sense, I did this, I did this, I did this, watch out. Now, that's a, that's a really good input. Anything else that you might want to ask, a way you'd frame a question? That's great. Yeah. Well, and you're, what you're dealing with right now is, is, is the real evidence of where your faith is tested and how, how real the, your faith is, right? Because of the sickness. Great. No, it's a great testimony. It sure is. <laughs> Thank you. Pretty easy. Yeah. Oh, but no, but it's 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 evident. It's evident in how a person deals and copes with life. Yeah, I think you and you. I really appreciate what you're saying in your example. Any final thoughts from anybody? So why don't we? I think we we're good for today. Are you okay to wrap it up? All right, then let's do that. Um, I hope you're encouraged about what we've talked about today. And like I said, why every time I teach it, it's just a, it's just this constant reflecting. Well, you know, where am I at in these things? Because I, this is for me, and I hope it's it's an encouragement to you as well.
and that this is helping to even equip and encourage you in your leadership and in your Christian lives. All right, then thank you so much. I will pray as we close, and then uh, we'll be done. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the reminder of your majesty, your immensity. Our minds can't even begin to grasp it, and that's okay. You want us to just trust you and have faith in you, and I pray that each of us in our journeys that we will continue to grow in our faith and our trust in you, keeping our eyes on you, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross because he knew what lay ahead and we have eternity to look forward to. Help us to serve you faithfully and in the context of leadership, help us to remember these lessons we're talking about, that it's about others, it's about giving you the glory, complete, uh, fulfilling your agenda, living with a character that honors you. I thank you for all of this and thank you each one here. Encourage each of them in we know exactly what they're going through these days, but bless and encourage them, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.